Dr. Phil Dater, MD, joining us today. Dr. Dater is the founder of Gemtech and has been innovating suppressors since 1976. Dr. Dater has won many awards over the decades, one of them being the Chin Award in 2016, given by the National Defense Industrial Association. The Chin Award is awarded to someone for their innovation and contribution to the general military capability of the United States. The recipient is in the field of science, engineering, test and evaluation, manufacturing, academic study, and research of modern weapon systems. So Phil, you're still active with your work. Could you tell us about your classes you teach, the ATF, and the th other three-letter agencies? The Chin Award is given to one person a year, and we're proud to have you with us today. Uh, thank you. Um, I, a number of years ago, Dan Shea of uh, uh, Small Arms Review magazine talked me into giving a, a three-hour uh, lecture on silencer design for one of the, uh, the 10th anniversary of the magazine. And uh, I did, and then he, and he liked it, and everyone seemed to enjoy it, so he said, well, you need to do a class. And uh, I said, well, I don't really want to, but we, he, he talked me into it and started doing a, a class well, a couple of times a year down in Henderson, Nevada at, uh, at his facility. And the class, the, uh, the subject material just grew uh, as I learned more and experimented more. And we uh, uh, eventually, we started getting a lot of uh, military procurement people uh, taking the class uh, to see basically what silencers can and can't do. Um, because they really don't silence anything, they just reduce the sound level a bit. And um, also what some of the problems are as far as the military is concerned and, uh, and the civilian market and police market also. And we, uh, uh, and the thing, the, the class just grew and a couple of years ago I told Dan, you know, um, when we started giving the class here in Boise, uh, I, I told him, you know, I don't really want to have just um, average uh, or civilians taking the thing because this is aimed more at the, the military and, uh, and, and the forensic groups. So I'd like to restrict it to that. And so we started doing that. Now, uh, about uh, oh, three or four years ago, I uh, was talked into going back to Martinsburg, West Virginia, and doing a class at ATF's facility there. And of course, I got to spend some time in their reference library and the reference collection. And it, it is, it was, it's a fabulous collection. It mm. really is. Um, but they, they were very impressed with it. And then, you know, when we were giving the class here in Boise, they started sending people from Tech Branch uh, to take the class, and now my understanding is that they want uh, uh, most or all of the new uh, people in Tech Branch to take my class, along with a bunch of uh, uh, classes that Dan teaches um, in Henderson. And, uh, and occasionally we have people from other uh, federal agencies, and uh, we frequently have uh, people uh, military people from uh, overseas that have been uh, vetted by um, Dan's company. And uh, so there's no State Department issues, there are no ITAR issues. None of the technology that I teach is really classified. Every bit of it is available on the internet. Uh, it's just that I think I organized it pretty well and I do, do a pretty decent job uh, uh, explaining things. So making things simple. So you're saying we can't take the class because we're not a part of the three-letter alphabet <laughs> groups? <laughs> you're competitors. <laughs> I, well, I like that. I've, I've, I've received a lot of criticism from my uh, peers at Gemtech about uh, teaching the class and, and uh, having people from uh, Wilson Arms and uh, Barrett um, and uh, whole, 
whole bunch of other uh, uh, suppressor manufacturers sending their engineers in and uh, <coughs> learning the process of designing uh, suppressors. The, the class is not a how to, how to build it. You know, it's not, uh, uh, we give you a set of plans and, and uh, tell you how to turn the lathe on and, and this or it's not that. It is the things that you have to think about in the design process. You have to worry about uh, heat buildup. Uh, you have to worry about um, uh, uh, strength of materials, uh, galvanic corrosion. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of, uh, of issues that, that come up. And also, how the, how the suppressor affects the weapon, mm -hmm. which it does. Yeah. Let's back up a little bit. Talk, let's talk about what got you started. Now, you used to be, or you, you still are, you're an MD. Initially, I was a pediatrician, mm -hmm. and I took a pediatric residency at the University of New Mexico. Uh, and then I, uh, after the, uh, the death of my son, uh, I decided I had difficulty making decisions about children. And so I took a residency at uh, Loveless Clinic uh, in uh, diagnostic radiology. And so radiology is what I practiced. I did deliver babies in medical school. In fact, in medical school, as a senior medical student, I delivered over 100 babies. Okay, now, and you were in the Air Force as well? I was in the Air Force, and, and I went into the Air Force uh, right out of a rotating internship. Actually, I was, during, during my internship, I, uh, I called my draft board, <laughs> this was 1965, and said, you know, where do I stand? And they said, well, we just sent one of your fellow interns his, uh, uh, his draft notice. Um, you have just received your notice to go for the pre-induction physical, uh, which I went up to, I was li in living in Wichita, Kansas, I went up to Kansas City for. And uh, they knew I was a physician, and I was the only one who got a thorough physical, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, <laughs> yeah, most of the time, it's just sort of walk by and you know, open your mouth and walk by with a flashlight. No, they really looked in my mouth and, and, and elsewhere. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I said, well, you know, how do I avoid the Army? <laughs> And they said, well, you, you, you have a choice. You can volunteer for the Air Force or Navy or, or Merchant Marine. And I said, uh, I want to do that. Uh, they said, are you serious? And I said, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I'd like to go into either the Air Force or the Navy, but I just don't want the Army and, and, uh, and the foxholes you know, in, in Vietnam. So... Anyhow, I applied to both the Navy and the Air Force, and the Air Force got back to me first. And uh, <clears throat> bottom line was I ended up uh, uh, six months later in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, being converted from uh, uh, a uh, uh, physician into an officer and a gentleman. They weren't very successful in the latter part, but that's another story. <laughs> that's good. Um, I, I was stationed, by the way, at... Uh, Walker Air Force Base, which in case you don't know, is in Roswell, New Mexico, and it used to be called Roswell Army Airfield. And I must admit that we had no, uh, uh, no knowledge or talk in town or anything like that of uh, space aliens. The only aliens we had were border crossers, you know, and they spoke Spanish and I didn't. But that's, that's, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> How did you get your start with suppressors? What motivated you to start <clears throat> developing suppressors? When people go through a divorce, they, uh, they feel kind of crappy about themselves, and so they buy themselves presents. And uh, uh, I was living in Albuquerque at the time, and I went to a... a uh, one of the sporting goods stores. I'd just seen the, the movie McHugh with John Wayne. Lon, I have a little um, equalizer here. We're going to try to sell it to the department. The Ingram. Ingram, huh? Nine millimeter. Six, seven pounds? 6.25. Silencer makes a nice handle. Lon, this can here is filled with water. Go on, squeeze off a burst. Why not?
How about that? Those 32 slugs came out in a second and a half. Uh -huh. Did you ever see anything like it? Hey, you're not going to take it, are you? Just say it's a loan. Lon? It's not licensed. Jack, neither am I. And the, and the Ingram submachine gun. And I said, boy, that was neat, you know. Uh, and I went to a local sporting goods store and said, you know, is there anyone around who sells this sort of stuff? And they sent me to uh, a little hole in the wall called Sir Sidney Su Submachine Gun Sales. And uh, I walked in there and, and purchased a, uh, an Ingram M11 in um, 380 and this matching suppressor for it. And three weeks later, the Form 4 was approved. Uh, they, you know, ATF was able to do that in those days when, when they had just three girls running the registry and, and uh, they kept the records on uh, four by six file cards and shoe boxes, you know? That was before the days of computers. Now they have computers which, you know, fuck up everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But, and then soon after that, I bought a, um, from uh, through Sir Sidney's, a military armament corporation Ruger 22 pistol that had an integral suppressor built onto it. And I went home and uh, shot it in the backyard, um, and it was, worked wonderfully for about four or five hundred rounds, and then it wasn't very quiet anymore. And so I called Military Armament Corporation, and they, they said, uh, oh, <laughs> we can't do anything about it. it uh, this is supposed to be something that was uh, taken out and used uh, a box of ammunition once a year for familiarization, and then go on a mission and get deep sixed. And in fact, the, the uh, suppressor itself had, the only marking on it was a serial number. There was no manufacturer's name or anything like that. Uh, so anyhow, they said, you know, well, it can't, it can't take it apart. Well, I don't like the word can't. Uh, and so I figured out how to take it apart, how to uh, repack it. Now, the, 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 the baffle stack, if you want to call it that, was basically just a, a series of round um, uh, screen washers just stacked up and, and it was a, built on a Mark I Ruger, which had a barrel that stuck out about, oh, four, about five inches from the receiver. And they um, uh, had a bunch of holes, about 40 odd holes in the barrel. This is basically, it turned out, old World War II technology. Um, and uh, uh, so, I, well, the screen washers, I wasn't going to try to punch those out. Couldn't get the right size screen anyhow. But I found that, uh, you know, a, a, a good packing was a, a, a chore boy, pure copper scouring pads. And I took them apart, built them into uh, little ropes, made a tool and wrapped them around and just beat them tight in there. Mm. And uh, rejuvenated the, the, uh, the unit. And I got to think, I think I can improve on this. And I was, you know, staff radiologist at that time at Loveless Clinic. And when normally when we were on call on the weekend, we'd take call from home and then come in if uh, if if we were needed to do a actually do a do a study. Uh, but we'd come in maybe once a day anyhow and read all the films that had been taken or interpret them. But we had a. Uh, department chairman at that time who decided that the radiologist needed to sit there on his can uh, all day Saturday and all day Sunday. Uh, gave us an hour off to go to church during, on Sunday morning. But, uh, and I said, God, what am I going to do here? This is, you know, this is boring. Uh, there isn't that much work. And he said, well, read journals. Well, you know, medical journals are some of the driest things. I mean, they, they they, they substitute really well for sleeping medicine. <laughs> and, and radiology journals are even worse. Um, 
<clears throat> so I did a number of things. I took a correspondence course in locksmithing. Uh, uh, <clears throat> did a little bit of uh, uh, freehand artwork. But also uh, figured out a better way to build that pistol, a better way to, to repack it. And I found that we had a uh, machine shop in the basement of the x-ray department. And I got the key to it. And it had a lathe that was uh, very similar to one that I was trained on when I was in high school, at, uh, working summers at uh, uh, Coleman Lamp and Stove Company in Wichita, Kansas. And so I was off and running. And I built the, the first prototype down there. Wow. Do you still have it? No, I, I uh, uh, sold it about 30 years ago. Oh, man. But I have uh, uh, a replica of it. Um, there, was a, uh, there was a murder in Las Vegas a, a number of years ago. Uh, a uh, real estate developer who just couldn't keep his dick in his pants <laughs> who was running around, and all of a sudden he turns up dead one one. Uh, Day. The disappearance of a millionaire real estate developer in Las Vegas had all the appearances of foul play. In his will, he had hinted that something terrible might happen to him. And a scuba diver, a ballistics expert, and a pizza delivery man all provided evidence that his premonition was correct. Of course, the wife is always the one they look at, especially since she was the victim <laughs> in many respects. And uh, one of the one of the forensic guys who uh, down there, a fellow named Tori Johnson, who was head of the Las Vegas Crime Lab, uh, <clears throat> said that he investigated the, this murder, and, and uh, uh, they never found they didn't find the weapon. But the bullet looked really strange that they took out, out of uh, Mr. Rudin's head uh, at the autopsy. And anyhow, about uh, two years later, a couple of fishermen were fishing in just below Hoover Dam in one of the, the little lakes down there. And lo and behold, they bring out this pistol. And of course, they do the right thing. They call the police department. The cops come and take it. And, take it to the crime lab, and the crime lab cleans it up a little bit and says, hmm, it looks like it has an integral suppressor in it. They, they shoot it, recover the bullet from the, uh, the trap, and Tori says, you know, that bullet looks really familiar. Huh. And, uh, and it was a perfect match for the one they took out of Ron Rudin's head. And I said, wow. And Tori gave me a, um, a picture of the gun, and it had been underwater for two years. Yeah. And uh, I looked at the serial number on there and the markings on the suppressor, and I built it. Oh, wow. It was, it was the 11th gun I'd built. Uh, uh, but that was, that, was, uh, that was in the old days. And then, you know, I, I worked with a, a fellow named Sid McQueen who ran Sir Sidney's sidearm sales. And we worked under his license. Uh, and I think uh, for him, I, I did uh, uh, probably about 25 weapons, somewhere along in there. And then I got, I, and I had a class three uh, dealer's license at that time. And I went ahead and upped that to a uh, class two manufacturer and started doing it on my own. Initially, basically copied and improved upon, in my opinion, uh, the Military Armament Corporation designs for on the Rugers, and it just went from there. Blossomed from there. Yeah. And then is that when you formed Gemtech officially? No, 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 no. no. That was my my little company was Automatic Weapons Company. It it uh, it basically formed in about 1978. Um, and uh, uh, Gemtech didn't wasn't formed until about '93. Okay. Very cool. But I built un, under um, built in New Mexico, 
under the name Automatic Weapons Company, uh, first in Albuquerque, and then secondly up in uh, northern New Mexico in Taos County. Uh, so was it not until the 90s that you moved to Idaho then? Yeah, 91, <laughs> we, in June of 91 we moved to Idaho. And I'm assuming that's where you got the, that's where the name GemTech comes from because it's the gem state? No, no. it didn't. Uh, <laughs> It's an interesting story. I, I put a little ad in uh, uh, Machine Gun News, which was uh, the up-and-coming magazine for the Title II community. And uh, a fellow in, uh, in, over in Yakima contacted me, a fellow named Jim Ryan, and his partner, uh, Mark Weiss. And they came over and we did some sound measurements and we started working together on a lot of things, and Jim said, "Why don't we, why don't we just uh, go ahead and, uh, you know, affiliate and, and and work together?" And I said, "Well, that sounds good to me." And so it was on uh, May twenty third that we incorporated. Uh, and why did we pick GemTech? Well, actually. We picked Gemini Technologies Incorporated, hmm. and we wanted we wanted a name that did not sound like uh, uh, Billy Bob's Gun Shop, you know, because that uh, 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 Billy Bob's Gun Shop, as the return address on UPS says, steal me. Mm -hmm. So we picked an absolutely innocuous name, Gemini Technologies. And why Gemini? Well, it was the sign of Gemini. <laughs> you know, it, was, it was after May 20th and before June 20th. So that was the sun sign of Gemini. Huh. My wife was an, was an astrologer at the time. So. Wow. So, that's a cool so that, story. That, that's, where, that's where it came. And then, uh, and then GemTech is just an abbreviation of that. Yeah. There's a lot of debate around proprietary sound testing. What are your thoughts on this style of testing? and how it applies to the scientific method, how should the public view testing methods like this? That's kind of a complex question. Um, <clears throat> let me start off with my experiences with, uh, with sound measuring. And my first experience with it was I had no idea how the, some of the things I was building uh, performed. So I called Reed Knight and I said, I'm going to send a couple of cans down to you. And would you do sound testing? He had the, the B and K 2209 meter, and, uh, which was sort of the standard of the day. And he said yes, and I got back and the results were, were interesting. Uh, the non-suppressed levels and suppressed levels uh, were interesting. Now I had been reading a little bit in the uh, Frankfurt Arsenal report, uh, I think it was FAR 1896, uh, where the Frankfurt Arsenals did some, uh, some sound testing. And what they did was they took broadcast quality microphones, which are one inch microphones, and an Ampex tape recorder, broadcast tape recorder, and went out in the field and did some measurements. And I'm, I don't remember exactly what uh, distance they used from, from the muzzle. I think it was something like a, uh, five meters to the side to the side of the muzzle, and then they went back and played the tape into an oscilloscope, and then took the calipers and measured the height of uh, peaks and this sort of thing, and they came up with a non-suppressed level on the. I, I just I, I remember on one particular weapon, the, the Sten Mark II, uh, non-suppressed was was 120 decibels and suppressed was uh, 90 decibels, which is about, you know, 30 reduction. Well, <clears throat> that is actually not very realistic. There's a couple of real problems with it. One is the inertia of the size of the microphone element uh, means that they're, they're missing the entire peak, uh, or almost the entire peak. And uh, then, you know, going from tape and then playing back the tape, it's... Uh, it was an early method, early attempt at, at doing, at quantitating uh, sound uh, levels. <clears throat> Reed Knight and uh, uh, Mickey Finn and Don Walsh together 
bought a BNK 2209 meter, which had a fairly fast rise time or response time of uh, 20 microseconds or better. And they started doing sound measurements, and their measurements were on you know, a nine millimeter pistol, uh, somewhere a little over 160 decibels. Uh, they used uh, uh, weighting because, uh, as Mickey said, it made the numbers look better. Um, in fact, he used C-weighting. Technically, weighting probably shouldn't be used, but uh, that's, that's, that's another story. I talked back and forth with Reed a bit, and um, he said, you know, you ought to look at Larson Davis. Uh, they, have, they have a really nice little portable meter, a Model 700. So I, I went and, and talked to, to Larson Davis and bought one of their little meters. Now, the meter was fairly compact and it had a 3 8 inch microphone with, on a, an ex extension cord. And I started to get uh, readings that were not, not like what Reed was getting, with the same, with, actually with the same suppressor that he had measured. I was getting uh, lower readings, and I got to think uh, that there may be a problem with the, uh, uh, <coughs> with, with, the, with the equipment, but it doesn't really do the job. So I called the engineer back at Larson Davis. He said, really what you need is the, the 800B. It's got the 20 microsecond or better rise time and the quarter inch pressure microphone. And uh, I said, well, we, we take back this one, uh, give me credit on it. He said, not normally, but yeah, we will, because it was not, we sold you something that didn't really do the job. And I got the 800B and I started to get very similar results to what uh, Reed and Mickey had been getting on, on things. Now, the, the, the measurements that we take uh, the, the, the meter, the B and K and the 800B, both do the highest single peak that it, that it, it, uh, it, it hears. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, the, 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 problem, the problem is that the peak is pretty sharp. And if, if you have maybe if your your equipment responds in two or three microseconds, you get pretty close to to the peak, but at twenty microseconds, you're starting down on the on the downward slope a little bit, and at thirty, you're down a little further, and at fifty or a hundred microsecond rise time, you're you're you've you've missed most of the peak. We know that we're missing part of the peak. I mean, there's no question about it. The the weighting networks that are used uh, also degrade the meter performance a little bit. Um, but it has become pretty much the standard of the industry. And uh, uh, the, the protocol that, uh, that Knight and, and Finn used ended up being part of mill standard 1474D, 1474 period, <laughs> A, B, C, D. Mm -hmm. um, it's, pretty mu it's pretty much what we use in, in the industry. A number of, uh, first off, the, the, uh, the B&K 2209 has not been in production for over 30 years. The 800B has not been in production for over 25 years. Um, so the units are getting old. Uh, even factory repairs are, are difficult. There are a number of meters that uh, uh, law enforcement uses which you know have a response time of um, you know a quarter of a second or half a second, and they're just worthless for firearms. They're great for uh, measuring the, the tailpipe noise on on motorcycles, mm. you know, to write uh, tickets for excessive noise. One one of the meters that that is put out is put out by Larson Davis, and it's the LXT1. Uh, it has a rise time of 28 microseconds. Approximately, they say 30. It normally is is around around 28 or so. We have measured the LXT1 next to the 800B uh, side by side, to tape, rubber banding the microphones together, and and doing sound measurements. And if we are using either A or C weighting, they're within a half dB of each other. And for the purposes of uh, R&D and development and this sort of thing, 
that works. It's adequate, it's not perfect. Uh, B and K has a, a new meter that, relatively new, that they call the pulse system. Um, it's expensive. The equipment itself is somewhere around $15,000. Hmm. And that doesn't include the, uh, the software. And you have to use, uh, which is a lab, lab view version, which is about four or $5,000. Wow. Um, and the, the, it's a great machine. It's got probably a two or three microsecond rise time uh, and is a little more accurate. But for, for our purposes, it doesn't really make that much difference. The industry standard has basically become the, the, uh, the LXT1 from Larson Davis and uh, use either A or C weighting. They're, they're both very similar. The problem is there are, there are some, other, uh, equi there's some other equipment out there that's being used. There, there, there are new standards, for, mm -hmm. uh, for example. The, the NATO standard uh, does not measure one meter to the side of the, of the muzzle or the, at the ear, but rather at five meter distance, they measure every 30 degrees around the circle. A fellow named Robert Silvers, a while back, who uh, uh, came up with, with me measuring equipment. Um, he, he built his own analog to digital converter and uh, wrote, wrote a program for it. Uh, and he was saying that, you know, his was accurate, ours wasn't. Uh, his was all digital. I, uh, I talked to him a couple of times and I said, Robert, you know, I, I don't think you're right on this. Um, and, you know, this is just based on experience. And also, Larson Davis had told me that with a, a digital detector, peak detector, the fastest rise time you can get is around 28 microseconds because it, it has to do with the response time of the, uh, the electronic gates in there. Hmm. Uh, the, the old B&K 2209 and the uh, 800B from Larson Davis are both analog detectors. They have digital processing afterwards, but the detector, it's, the peak detector itself is analog. Uh, <clears throat> well, Robert Silvers did, did a number of uh, measurements, and uh, he did kind of hide the fact that he was uh, basically a part of Advanced Armament Corporation at the time. Hmm. And after about a year or so, we were talking at one point, and he said, Phil, I think you were right about that. We measured the rise time, and it, it was not, not as I had said. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's acceptable. The scientific method, you come up with an idea, you build an experiment to prove your point, and experiment, and if it, if it is successful, then you publish all the details so that your peer group can duplicate what you did. Now, even, even, even if it is proprietary, being proprietary is just is a relatively recent thing, um, but in all scientific stuff, uh, e even proprietary things, you encourage your, your peers to reproduce your results. And if they, do re if they can reproduce it under the same circumstances, then your, your, uh, your discovery it is completely valid. I remember back, I believe in the 70s, there was a couple of uh, physicists at the University of Utah who came up with the concept of cold fusion. Uh, it was uh, Fleischmann and Pons, uh, I believe, were the names of them. And <coughs> the concept of cold fusion, of course, is to m make hydrogen atoms combine in four hydrogen atoms into a helium atom, and you have a loss of mass in there, which is, uh, comes out as energy. If you look at Einstein's E equals mc squared, mm -hmm. um, and it's a hell of a lot of energy. Uh, they were getting a little bit out, not a whole lot. Well, this, uh, this of course, hit the, the, the popular press, and everyone was all enthused about it. The problem was that the peers could not reproduce it, mm -hmm. and so it, it, it it was decided that probably 
this didn't work. Now there is some work, there is some work in cold fusion that's going on currently. There is a company who is doing some uh, testing commercially. He's using proprietary equipment that I think he designed and built and proprietary software. Uh, and he's getting some results. Um, I'm not going to say the results are good or bad. Um, I don't know. I, I've, I've read some of the descriptions uh, of, of the process and what he's, what he's trying to accomplish. And I must admit I don't understand exactly what he's saying. Um, other people I know in, in the industry don't understand it either. Um, but he is coming out with, with some sort of results. Whether they're accurate or not, I, I can't say. Um, they don't necessarily agree with what, what we normally get, but we also can't uh, reproduce it because the software is proprietary and he, he, and he apparently won't release it. Uh, the equipment, same thing. So I, I don't know. The, the uh, mill standard 1474D basically measures uh, originally it was two meters, now it's one meter, to the left of the muzzle, perpendicular to the bore axis, and at a simulation of the, uh, the shooter's ear. Um, I think the numbers are eight centimeters back behind the receiver and about 18 centimeters to the side of the bullet flight path uh, or axis of, of the weapon. What our experience has been measuring in that location is with the semi-auto weapon, most of them seem to record the, pretty much the same. Um, a little louder, records a little louder with, with, without a suppressor uh, than it does with the suppressor, but it's not a whole lot. This, this of course, is looking at the risk to, the, to, to hearing. Um, the, the, the problem is that a lot of, a lot of the weapons uh, have, well, a lot of them are, are piston, piston semi-autos. And in a piston semi-auto, you have a gas port that is before the silencer. And you vent some gas to the atmosphere. E even if it's a really tight system, there's still some that, that vents to the atmosphere. And we've done high-speed videos that actually show the shock wave. Mm -hmm. Uh, coming out of out of the the gas block, uh, <clears throat> so a, as as an indication of how well the silencer works in protecting hearing, I, I'm not convinced that that that, that is a meaningful uh, uh, measurement because I don't think we're actually getting you know r real results on that um, measuring to the side of the muzzle does give an indication as to what's going down in the far field. And we're going to ignore for the time being the ballistic crack of the bullet flight noise. Mm -hmm. And we've done, we've done some measurements on this. Uh, and to the side shows really how well the silencer is reducing the muzzle blast. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, I think, what, what is important because in, for uh, military applications and law enforcement applications, the, the idea is to confuse the target um, and uh, mask the lo location of the shooter. Uh, actually, hunter hunters find this too. They uh, mm -hmm. used to like to shoot prairie dogs a lot. Yeah, <laughs> small furry animals at great distances. Yeah. No judgment here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when we'd use a suppressor, uh, <clears throat> All the, the prairie dog would hear really is the ballistic crack. And they stand up there and they, and they look around. And then when they finally spooked, they generally kind of ran toward you. <laughs> uh, well, they ran back in their hole, but it depended on you know, which side of the hole they were standing on. Coyotes definitely run back toward you. Um, and some of my rancher friends and customers have, have told me. <laughs> well, that answers my question. Okay. Um, that, like, Better than I was expecting. No. Well, uh, on the mill, on the mill standard, you know, it's, it's uh, <clears throat> they try to isolate things pretty well. Uh, you know, 
meter to the side of the muzzle gives good muzzle blast. They do it 1.6 meters above grass because grass does not have much reflection. If you do it above concrete, you're going to get a, a reflection. Mm -hmm. um, and although the, the reflected sound level is, is actually lower than the direct one, you know, there's inverse square law issues, it, it still, it still uh, is a little bit louder mm -hmm. uh, on measurements. Lynn McWilliams used to refuse to release sound um, measurements on, uh, for AWC systems technology. And he said, there's, uh, there's always going to be someone who doesn't measure sound levels, who subjectively says, oh, this is quieter than that. And if that one is doing um, uh, 30 dB, this one must be doing 40. Um, and it, it's, it's, it, makes, it makes it kind of meaningless. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, uh, too many people are really cranked up about uh, how many dBs does this have uh, without necessarily understanding what decibels are. Which, by the way, and, uh, the decibel scale is a logarithmic uh, ratio of the the sound pressure level measured in pascals or kilopascals to the threshold of human hearing, which is considered to be uh, defined as 20 micropascals. Mm. And, you know, we're dealing with really big numbers there, uh, which are kind of meaningless. And so they, they just uh, converted the ratio to a logarithm, um, and it makes it makes it a lot easier to, to do the math and, and handle it. Most of the meters are calibrated to uh, read out in decibels. So basically, make it simple to explain. Make it simple. Yeah. 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 Now, what what do I think the, uh, the the best purpose for using a, a sound meter as, as a manufacturer goes is, is development R and D. Um, you know, you go out with the same suppressor, two different days, you're going to get different, different readings. But the, the whole idea is to, to be able to see, did I make an improvement or not? Yeah, and, and you make a good point. I mean, so many people are caught up with the DB ratings. Yeah. And, and, and also how you got to there, to that point, you know, and, and, and a lot of feedback we get, not a lot, I should say, there are some trolls out there in the industry that want to come out of their cave and complain about, oh, well, you're the one doing the testing, so how are we supposed to trust that? Well, it's, we're using this type of testing, same as these other companies, and that's what we reached. You're welcome to get the meter and try it yourself. There, there, was, a, um, there was a guy in Arkansas a fellow named John Tetsworth, who was uh, uh, in the, uh, basically, he was a silencer a fan, bought a lot of silencers, ended up buying a meter. I think he, I think he had a, a B&K 2209, but I'm not certain on that. A and people would send him stuff to, to test. And he did, you know, testing and did it honestly and posted it on, on the Internet. And you could com see how your stuff compares to, to other people's. The problem is that uh, after a while, and he saw lots of other, what a lot of other people did, he uh, got in the business himself. <laughs> Smart. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, now he's gone back to doing just, uh, just real estate. Um, there was a writer, Al Paulson, who uh, uh, had a uh, 2209. And Al used to do a lot of uh, sound testing, and, and uh, I knew him well. Uh, he uh, basically got, uh, he had some health issues and ended up getting out of the business. Hmm. He, was, he was a writer. He wrote uh, uh, the silencer, some of the definitive silencer books. There's some, there's some people out there that, that are testing behind closed doors, and they're claiming to be the authority on it, and kind of... Holding everyone down, and they may they may end up being the authority sure. on it, but but I don't I don't necessarily understand what they are doing. One of one of the things we we had sponsored by Machine Gun News magazine uh, a number of years ago, 
In 1997, we had our first suppressor trials at, uh, at Knob Creek. And Al Paulson was there with his meter, and I had my meter there. And uh, uh, <coughs> there were, every, all the suppressor people came, and they brought their, their, their products and, and, and showed them. And uh, we, did, we did measurements. And we found, actually, there was a fairly significant difference in the readings between morning and afternoon. It had to do the mornings were cool, hmm. and the afternoons were hotter than hell. Hmm. Uh, so... Uh, the next year, we uh, at that t that time we tried. Each manufacturer did all of his things, and then the guys who did all of their things in the afternoon did not show up very well. Mm -hmm. um, but we had, we talked a lot, and, and there was a, a lot of gathering. Then, the two years later in '99, we repeated it, uh, sponsored by uh, I think it was still Machine Gun News. And we had a couple of physicists there who were trying to make a sort of a consumer reports type number. Uh, and on this one, we, we measured uh, all of a particular type of suppressor, hmm. that is 556 uh, AR-15 suppressors, and then uh, Glock suppressors. So, so that everything was being done pretty much at the same time, and it was a little more comparable. But we, we did accuracy, uh, sound level, weight, length. Um, there are a couple of other parameters in there. I can't remember what they were. Hmm. And then <clears throat> tried to figure out a formula to come up with a number, just like uh, Consumer Reports does on, sure. on cars. Mm -hmm. Everything was going quite nicely until uh, and some, the physicists were putting in a lot of time on, on this. And then it was noted that actually the, the best number was a non-suppressed Ruger 22 pistol. <laughs> that, and that, it wasn't the quietest. Right. But it was the lightest, mm -hmm. <laughs> the least expensive. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, it, there, there, were just, there were just too many factors in there. Sure. Yeah, I think um, nowadays consumers, I mean, we did talk about how a lot of people chase the DBs, but yeah. weight is a big part of that. And JK is trying to, you know, have that conversation, <laughs> especially with like the CCX. It's not necessarily the quietest suppressor on the planet, but it's concealable, it's small, it doesn't need a booster when you apply it to your handgun. And trying to change that narrative a little bit, um, people are starting to, to consider other elements. Weight's a big one too, especially for the hunters, right? The, the military, their requirements, first off, are, are flash and dust signature. Uh, and then there's uh, weight and length. I mean, these, these are guys, uh, I think you well know, who are carrying uh, packs that are 50% of their body weight or more, which one shouldn't do. 30% 30, 30 is the mo most one should do. And th they, um, uh, they're the guys who cut the handles off the toothbrush to save a couple of grams. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can't saddle them with something that, that's really heavy. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to look at the duty cycle the material. Um, if you go with too thin a material, it's going to rupture, uh, depending on, on the gas pressure. Um, duty cycle. Uh, if you're going to be shooting 100 round belts, uh, hammered down, you're not going to use the same suppressor that you use on, a say, a 308 sniper rifle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting to see a lot of the product that's out on the market today, too. I feel like, you know, and I've worked for a couple of different companies where it seems like some of these suppressors are overbuilt. In the military market, the, the uh, sound level is actually about fourth or fifth down, down the line. Hmm. In the civilian marketplace, what is number one? DB. No. No. It's number two. Number one is cool factor. Oh. We can build a suppressor today that's roughly the same size and has pretty much the same performance as something we built 25 years ago. We've done it. 
<clears throat> the problem is they won't buy the 25-year-old one because it's not cool. It's not state-of-the-art. Yeah, yeah. You know, oh, it uses baffles. Uh, it, it has to, we have to use a monocore. That's, that's the magic word. Mm -hmm. Well, the beauty of monocores, of course, is they're cheap to build. <laughs> hmm. You end up with a suppressor that has two parts in it, mm -hmm. the monocore and the outer tube. It's not necessarily durable. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, 3D printing. It's got to be 3D printed. That, that, that is the, the, the new magic thing. Yep. Well, when you do 3D printing, you get, you get people doing a lot of intricate little passages that, in theory, this is how the gas flows. And it, it uh, butts against here and it pushes it back this way and, and off that way. And the smaller the passages get and more complex, uh, they can only be done by 3D printing. But the problem is that what happens in the real world? Well, you got powder residue. And those things clog up eventually. Mm -hmm. You've got uh, vaporized lead that condenses in the relative cool of the suppressor. That clogs things up. Copper. Uh, we, we've, we've, uh, we've documented the, the amount of, of copper just from the jackets and the heat of friction of the, of the bullet going down the bore, mm. vaporizing parts of the copper jacket and plating it out. And, and you can see this on, on, the, on flash hiders. Mm. That's that green shit that's, uh, that's on them. Oh yeah, I've got but, plenty. But that, that clogs those little passages. You, you, you gotta have some room for the gases to expand and, and utilize your volume. There's, there's an art to designing a suppressor. And um, there are some people who feel that it can be done by computer. And I believe there are a couple of uh, engineers at uh, Oak Ridge came up with a computer program that will design suppressors. But there's an awful lot of variables in there. Mm -hmm. As a physician, you know, Medicine is not an exact science. Medicine is an art. Mm. You've led the way for suppressor innovation since the 70s. What suppressor project was your favorite? If you have one, I that do. might be hard. I, I do. It was one we did as Gemtech. It's 22 rimfire. We call it the Outback 2. Uh, the original Outback used uh, M baffles, which is basically a, 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 a spacer with a cone in, in the spacer. It's a very strong baffle. The uh, K baffle, which is a relatively weak baffle, but fine for rimfire and, and low pressure uh, pistol cartridges, um, is a little quieter. In fact, in, in the same size envelope, the, uh, the K baffle stack was uh, 5 dB quieter than the M baffle stack. I like, I like 22 because it is Hollywood size, and it's Hollywood quiet. Yeah, um, you're not dealing with that much gas. Yeah, yeah. I think I think a lot of people. I mean, if you're in the suppressor industry, and you, once you shoot 22, it just yeah, yeah. It, it, it yeah, it, it takes the fun out of everything else. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It, it's it's like shooting a shooting a, a pellet gun, yeah. and actually. A suppressed 22 uh, is frequently quieter than a, than a, a Benjamin pellet gun. Mm -hmm. I just want to say, Dater did it first. I think <laughs> it's important. And I say that, I know Dr. Phil Dater's looking at me like, don't say it wrong, but in truth be known, many companies out there today in the industry came from Dr. Phil Dater. So I was just saying, a lot of companies today in the industry of suppressors and silencers came from Dr. Phil Dater. That's why... I, I want to say Dater did it first because you are the modern day godfather of, you are, and, and he won't admit it, this man won't say anything about it, but he is. He is the modern day godfather and he's passing his knowledge technology to Jake, you know, Kuski from JK and many other companies. Um, and it's important that people understand that and know that from Dr. Phil Dater. So a lot of companies, I go through the list, AAC, you know, I can go through the list of all these different companies came from what Dr. Phil Dater did uh, in the past. You've been doing innovation since, we always said, 1976. And well, you have. And I appreciate everything you've done for the industry, Dr. Phil Dater. And I want people to know what you've done for this industry, for the silencers, so that people can shoot the product and understand it. And as a medical doctor, you've said many times, you understand what ear damage is. 
and you wanted to make sure that products were out there for people so they can actually shoot it, enjoy it, and they don't damage their ears. So thank you, Dr. Phil Dater, for everything you've done. You're well, fantastic. I, I, I want to throw a couple of comments in, in on the, the design process. The, 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 the first successful firearms silencers were, were made by Maxim in, in uh, his model um, 1909, 1910. Yeah, Dr. Shish. Yeah. Um, of course, he did a lot. He was in a lot of other industries, too. The, the motion picture industry, he was a major figure in. Uh, amateur radio, he was a major fig, fixture in. I mean, this, this was a guy who just went to, from idea to idea, probably came to him mostly in the shower in the morning. <laughs> um, what we have done is not necessarily um, unique. There are some unique things that, that have occurred. Uh, some of the monocores are unique, but a lot of that is based on Russian technology from the 70s. The, uh, the K-baffle, and I think Gemtech was the first to commercially use the, the K-baffle. I may be wrong there, but I, I think that is correct. Uh, but it was patented in, in uh, England in, in uh, the early 1900s. We look at patents, we look at what other people who have been successful in the industry are doing and see what they're doing, maybe duplicate it, but then see if we can make it better. And that's, that's been the main thing. Uh, um, <clears throat> you know, the early Maxim uh, suppressors, uh, the 22 ones were pretty good, the, the 30 caliber ones uh, were, were not very good, but he, he had baffles that were pretty close together. Uh, <clears throat> Well, if you space them out a little more, uh, they get quieter to a point. And then they start getting louder. So where is that magic point in there? Okay, well, all of a sudden you come up with, with, a, uh, uh, with a, uh, dimensions that, that give you optimum design. Then what happens if we put a little hole in here and jet gases? Does it work? Or does it make it worse? We did a, uh, uh, we competed in, in a uh, bid in 1996 for, for the SOCOM suppressor. We did not win. Fortunately, Knight Armament won. I say fortunately because they knew the, the, how to deal with the government, and we certainly did not. And to be honest, government contracts are the death of small businesses. Yeah. Um, you just, it's just almost impossible to comply with all of their requirements. That's why, you know, a toilet seat on, this, on the space shuttle costs, you know, several thousand dollars, whereas you can go over to Home Depot and get one for 20. <laughs> <laughs> this one thing uh, that we did for SOCOM, it had to be able to drain water in a certain amount of time. So it was a three baffle suppressor, and it's a stack that, you know, we still used when, uh, when Smith & Wesson bought us out. Uh, <clears throat> but there were, on the, the last baffle, there were three little peripheral holes, and it was to drain water. We found when we, when we put those holes in, we got about a 5 dB improvement over not having them. So I thought, well, gee, we'll put the holes in the other baffles, you know, same way. We lost everything. You know, mm. it, was, it was an empirical, experimental thing. And I, I do believe that the primarily suppressor design is a, an empirical process. You can use simulation uh, to, to get an idea of how gases flow, but it still is an empirical process. Well, it was an honor to sit here and, and be able to talk to you about well, can, your story. And I can I'm tell, you, just tell you more stories. I can keep, I can keep you here for, for a day and a half, two days telling you stories. <laughs> I mean, I've got a day and a half, two days. I can totally sit and hang out. We'll get a fire going. And <laughs> you don't want to edit all that film. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> well, thank you again, thank Phil. You. We really appreciate it. It's an honor. You're welcome. Thank you.